A reading from Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, that it be deep and sure or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman who is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 80 responsibly. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph by the flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors. Our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. You give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. A reading from Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit, of holiness as of resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to be belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved and loved who are called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. son, and he named him 
Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace through the Holy Spirit from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have you ever noticed as we go through the Advent season that it seems like it takes forever for the Sunday morning readings to sound anything like the Christmas story? I mean, here we are on the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we finally, finally get a story about the birth of Jesus. It seems like the first two Sundays of Advent are kind of like a sideshow with the first, first being about the return of Christ and then the second Sunday being kind of more about John the Baptist than Jesus. And even though he was a cousin of Jesus, I guess it kind of makes sense to say his, you know, his message is prepare the way of the Lord. Okay, that can kind of go with Advent, but then it almost, at least to me, it becomes kind of a relief when we get to the Sunday where the children do their Christmas program. Because we finally get a chance to hear the Christmas story. And it's told by the youngest of us, so we just get a little bit of satisfaction for our Christmas longing. And here we are, finally, the fourth Sunday of Advent, we get a reading that sounds like the Christmas story. The only problem is, Matthew doesn't give us a whole lot of detail. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, all he says is, it, it's kind of more about convincing Joseph than the actual birth of Jesus. I mean, Jesus gets one sentence in the whole thing. If this were to be written as a screenplay, I can't see how any of the screenwriters would be able to get more than a half hour Christmas special out of it. You know, where, where Luke gives us a full two hour full length movie, Matthew gives us a couple of sentences. That's it. I mean, with Luke you get Mary and Joseph and angels and Bethlehem and shepherds and wise men. Well, wise men are actually in Matthew, but Matthew, what we get is Joseph had a dream. Okay. We're left to figure out all the other stuff. And biblical scholars have spent decades filling in all the details. First, a lot of scholars focus on the engagement. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people try to project modern engagement thinking onto the engagement of Joseph and Mary. However, when the Bible says that Mary and Joseph were engaged, they were as good as married. I mean, that's how it worked in Joseph and Mary's time, was when they were engaged, they were as good as married as far as the rest of society was concerned. And even though the Bible is specific about the fact that Joseph and Mary had not yet been living together, at this time in history, when Joseph and Mary were alive, it was not all it was not at all unusual for brides to become pregnant before the two were living together. It just wasn't going to be a big scandal in those days, but it could have been a scandal if the community had found out that Joseph isn't the father. But Joseph, being a righteous man, knows that even though he's not the one that got Mary pregnant, he's not willing to publicly disgrace her. So he's contemplating about what to do. What is he supposed to do about this issue? Now, what I'd like to know is, why does God always seem to wait until the last possible moment? I mean, the angel doesn't even show up until Joseph had just resolved to dismiss Mary without making a public spectacle about it, which, by the way, would have been his right so that he could declare himself a single man again. But just as he's resolved to find a quiet way to dismiss Mary, an angel shows up. What lousy timing. I mean, why couldn't the angel show up 
before Joseph went through all this consternation, right? I mean, why didn't the angel intervene as soon as Joseph found out about the pregnancy? The angel could have shown up right then and said, don't worry, Joseph, it's going to be okay. But no, Joseph had to go through this angst. It just seems like the whole thing could have been handled more smoothly, you know what I mean? But maybe God did it this way so that Joseph and Mary would have a really good story for the grandkids someday. <laughs> I don't know. What I do know is that the angel gives Joseph some very specific instructions. The first thing is he's to invite Mary into his home as if nothing happened that was improper in their relationship. Because, well, that's true. Nothing improper had happened. And this is as much a gift to Mary as it is to Joseph. By taking Mary into his home, then everybody would just assume that the child that Mary bore was Joseph's. No big deal. Nobody would even question it. Only Joseph and Mary would know the divine origin of their child. Now the next detail is pretty easy to overlook. The fact that the angel gives Joseph the responsibility of naming the child, that's actually a pretty big deal in the ancient Jewish world. I mean, in the Gospel of Luke, Mary is actually given the task of naming the child, but in Matthew, the naming is given to Joseph. And it may not sound like a big deal, but a man naming a child that isn't even his basically proclaims to the world that this man is claiming his place as the child's father. Joseph is perfectly willing to take on the role of being the father of Jesus as if Jesus was his own child. Even with the full knowledge that they're not biologically related, Jesus is going to grow up in a good Jewish home with both parents treating him as their own child. By their actions, by being willing to take on the task of bearing and raising the Son of God, Joseph and Mary are showing that they are good and faithful Jewish people. Neither one of them, of course, neither one of them are superheroes. They don't have any superpowers. Neither one of them are particularly gifted in any way. Not that we know of. I mean, Joseph apparently was a pretty good carpenter. But neither one of them are particularly wealthy or even well-known, or have any real distinctive qualities other than they're faithful people. That's it. Simply put, they were just people who were simply willing to listen to God and willing to obey what God asked them to do. They're even willing to derail their own plans. They're willing to give up their own ambitions, their own hopes, their own dreams to fulfill what God has called them to do. And maybe that's why Jesus had to be born when he was and where he was and to whom he was. I mean, maybe God knew that this combination of Joseph and Mary, two faithful people, two people willing to follow wherever God leads, that's pretty rare. These two people are willing to set aside all that they had planned for themselves. And they're willing to follow the call of God, even though that call meant personal sacrifice. These two people are willing to give up all they had known. And even they'll find out that they have to be willing to uproot themselves and go to Egypt just for the sake of this child that was an unexpected surprise. So in these days of self-fulfillment, self-indulgent, and self-centered lifestyles, where even we take pictures called selfies, I mean, I'm not sure that God would even find people today who would be willing to give birth to another savior of the world. The good news is, it's already been done. The hard work is already accomplished. Mary and Joseph gave Jesus exactly what God wanted. They gave him a faithful home, full of love, full of righteousness, 
and full of the promise of God's unending presence. All that Mary and Joseph had to do was to say yes, and God took care of the rest.